Okay, let's have a look see at the Olmucky M Spectre Inspection Scope 2309 20. I bought this after being completely taken by this little thermal imager gun. I, I, I really like this, so I thought this would be a cool thing to have as well. Eh, not so sure. Let me show you why. So the intertube shows that this product comes in a blow molded case, but mine came in a soft bag. Not entirely sure about that. I, I know that blow molded cases are really space inefficient and bags, while they're soft, you can squish things in them and stuff like that. But do you really want to do that? Isn't this cable a little bit on the delicate side? Shouldn't it have a blow molded case like for a home position? And really, you're gonna be like throwing in your heavy tools with this thing? I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical about the bag. So out of the bag, what do we see? First of all, the thing's huge. Look at this, I can't even fit it in the camera frame. Just compare it to the little uh, infrared imager. This thing is monstrous. Even the pistol grip is considerably fatter. What's going on? This is so nice and ergonomic, you can throw it in your pocket. Th this is really quite awkward. At the very least, the camera cable should be removable. Maybe screw on or bayonet fixture or something like that. Uh, here's the label on the rear end. We got the brand name. We got a little electrical warning here. Be careful sticking in the walls and stuff like that. You got the model name. Prominently Wisconsin, USA. Made in China, huh? Got a 9 volt battery catalog number. Look at that. FCC. That's the Federal uh, Communications Commission. That's like, like radio waves and stuff like that. You don't see that on the infrared imager. I wonder why that isn't gotta be because of this big long fucking antenna on the back of this thing. The rubber over molds are typical of Omaki, seem very similar, but the red plastics are a little bit different. I found that this infrared imager uses a nylon, glass filled nylon. This on the other hand, we'll have to investigate that. It's a little bit more glossy in appearance. This glass filled nylon tends to be kind of dull and matte. It's a little bit shiny. And here's the business end defrocked from its pipe guide. Notice that really tiny little camera lens in there surrounded by four LEDs with one, two, three, four levels of power. The camera cable's a little bit longer than the specified 36 inches by about nine millimeters in diameter, exclusive of the pipe guide attachment, which, well, you're never really gonna wanna remove that because like, really, it's gonna get lost immediately. You know that. The display is about two and three quarters of an inch in diagonal and it's inset in this rubber surround. This rubber surround is gonna provide some protection for bumps and knocks. However, I really do like the deeply inset screen on this infrared imager, not just for the protective value, but it provides a little bit of shading so you can see the display in bright light nice and easily. The handle's quite chubby. And where's the trigger? I want a trigger! Instead, you got these soft buttons. You got lamp down, you got lamp up. I want a trigger! And what's up with the crooked user interface here? Come on, that doesn't inspire confidence. All right, let's take it apart. Start with the battery cover and just take a look at this infrared imager here. Stick the screwdriver in. I really don't like using a screwdriver. It really should just be thumb operated, but let's twist it open and release the battery. Okay, now let's try it on this guy here. Stick in the stupid screwdriver, which really isn't necessary. Get it in there and... What? Oh! You have to... Open it the opposite. What the heck? Come on, you could do better for a user interface than that. Jesus. I right, pull the battery out and we find that it's on a wire terminal again, like the thermal imager. Really not impressed with wire terminals. Much prefer to just stick the battery in and have it clip into place, just like that. Pop the pin out. Interesting. It's not like in the thermal imager, which was a stainless steel pin. This here's aluminum. And now we're going to remove the battery cover and take a look at it. You see it has the rubber over mold here. Oh, there's a plastic marking. You got TPS, that's thermoplastic styrene, styrene butadine. That's the rubber over mold part. And interestingly, ABS plastic. It's not nylon. It's not glass filled nylon like other Milwaukee tools, including the thermal imager. ABS is an inferior plastic. It's decent, but it's inferior. I kind of wonder if that's why it has these ribs. And let's take a look inside the handle. Again, we see these ribs for stiffening it up. I wonder if that's why the handle is so much fatter than in this thermal imager. Perhaps. 
Yeah, this doesn't have nearly as much ribbing for, for stiffness. In fact, it doesn't really have any ribbing on the, on the battery cover. Unsurprisingly, the main body is also TPS ABS. Okay, let's pull it apart. Oh, hey, wait a second. Look at that. Security torques? Come on, Milwaukee. You even provided parts diagram for people to replace parts. Security torques? Really? Clearly, everybody needs a set of security bits. Not really expecting to see too much in here. It's going to be all major digital, but uh, let's take it apart and see, see what we can see. Just a friggin' computer and a display board and some wiring for the camera. Notice that there's a lot more plastic left on the threads of these screws than the nylon tools. Softer plastic. And we're in like sim. So here we can see the major digital board brain box. Interesting that they have a conformal coating on this and we also see this gasket surrounding. Presumably this is meant for use by plumbers occasionally who might be getting this all wet. However, this conformal coating, they carefully avoided applying it wherever there's connectors. You can see it on this connector 2, and this connector 3 to the display is not coated. And on this side of the clamshell, we can see where the camera cable comes in. You got a big glob of elastic there to keep it in place. And we got two RF chokes that we see there. Those RF chokes must be because this long camera cable is going to be acting like a big antenna. So presumably whatever circuitry gets the uh, signal here is sensitive to RF frequencies and all well, that, that gets rid of them. That helps choke them out. What else do we see here? A little piece of plastic that's marked. Fascinating. And what is it marked? Ooh, PA66. That's nylon 66. That's the most expensive piece of plastic on here. Of course, it's only the size of my thumbnail. And behind this piece of PA66, we got an O-ring. This piece of plastic backs the battery door locking mechanism. So the front end seems fairly well gasketed to prevent water ingress. The gasket extends around here. This battery terminal wire, you can see, not very well protected, but somewhat an RF choke to the terminal. In the name of science, let's see what other sort of water protection has been added. And here we see the tactile switches on the board with lots of glossy conformal coating all over it. Very, very rubbery in texture. And here's where the meat bag meets the machine and these buttons have lots of rubber to prevent water ingress. Even the LED light guide has a rubber condom around it. I gotta see what's under this board. I need a full accounting of all the prophylactics. Lots of conformal coating. TTI part number. TTI is the parent company of Wilmucky. The display is also protected from any sort of fluid mishap by a rubber. ABS is really soft. You gotta be careful with these screws that you're not gonna strip those posts. You never really know when you're bottoming out. We got a seat, the connectors, and smush the clamshell together. It seems like it's a poorly fitting clamshell, but that's just the gasket compressing. These larger and more coarsely threaded screws bottom out with a little bit more certainty. All that water protection, but no gasket here on the battery chamber. Arg! A lock. All right, let's fire it up. I got a 9 volt nickel methyl hydride battery in there. Immediately when I turn it on, that low battery warning, whoa, now it just disappeared. What's going on? Generally, these battery warnings are simple voltage determined. Basically, when the battery goes below a certain voltage, the light turns on. That's kind of curious. What that seems to suggest to me is that it's drawing a lot of power from the battery and depressing the voltage down, and then the battery recovers and the light goes out. Okay, let's see if I can figure out what this battery indicator issue is. Here are the batteries at 8.8 .8 volts about. Throw the unit on, notice that turns on, and that warning light turns on, and the voltage is being depressed down to uh, 8.6 volts or so. But that light turns out, the voltage is not going back up, it's not recovering. Let's turn the LED array on to the first level, second level, third level, 
in the fourth level, and we see that the voltage is being depressed even further, but the indicator's not turning back on again. All right, let's take a look at current use. Throw it on and overload. 150 milliamps, that is a lot of power for a little 9 volt battery. Most alkaline batteries at that rate of discharge have only about 300 milliamp hours in them, maybe 400 at best. Let's throw the light on, and 164, 74, 83, 230 milliamps. We're looking at maybe an hour of runtime with the light on full blast. Yeah, th th this unit is drawing a fair amount of current, probably a little too much for a little 9-volt battery. And that's why that nickel-methyl hydride, it's kind of, the computer doesn't know how to deal with it. Okay, before we go where the sun really don't shine, let's have a peek in some drawers. LED brightness is only at the first level. Here's some 1 8 Dremel diamond-type bits. Resolution's not fantastic. But close focus is not bad at all, really. We'll get close up. Now let's test it down a dark, dank hole where the sun don't shine. Here's some ABS sewer pipe, and here's a clog. Stuck down about 28 inches. And to simulate that lost wedding ring and near divorce, here's a penny and a dime. Now fecal matter would complete the simulation, but not today, thank you. Instead, I made up some chunky dilute oatmeal mix. Now let's taste the pudding, or at least the oatmeal, and what we find at the bottom is to temper our expectations in underwater exploration. That water is way too murky and those LEDs just light up a fog. So now with a more dilute mixture, maybe we can see something. Here's the inside of the pipe, and here's the water interface reflecting those four LEDs. And at the bottom, the penny and the dime just briefly pop into focus, though I really could not improve the view. Just nothing but reflections and blur. Screen performance. The screen is a little bit washed out, but I think this camera's making it worse. It, it does look a little bit better than the eye. My shop really is quite blindingly bright, Though I have noticed that the screen is not really a match for daylight. It doesn't work too well in the day. Let's see how it responds to different angles. Not bad in that direction. Quite good, actually. Yeah, that's interesting. It, the camera picks it up even better from the side than from the front. Actually, from the front to the naked eye, it's it's a little bit more like that for color saturation. However, when you turn it this way, the screen becomes entirely washed out, and that's not just the reflection above. Let me shade the reflection. You can see the screen is actually washing out quite considerably. That is a little bit of a problem I have found in just playing around with this, looking under cabinets and under the refrigerator and stuff like that. Uh, I have found that sometimes you need to have it in, in that angle and you're looking down, it's close to the ground, and yeah, it, it, it's difficult. That's where I think it might be a good idea if this cable was detachable. And that way you can hold this at the optimal angle, and then you can hold the, the camera cable in whatever manner you want. Not, not the best, but you know, what can you expect from a display that's powered by a 9-volt battery? I still think that if they made the display a little bit smaller, they could have made it more bright. So do I have room for this tool? I'm not so sure. It's kind of bulky. It's kind of awkward. Though I do appreciate its all-in-oneness. Uh, it's waterproof -ivity that it uses a standard 9-volt battery, though it really does tend to chew through those pretty quickly in my estimation. If you do get one, make sure you also get some good 9-volt rechargeables. They do seem to mess around with the low battery sensor, but they do seem to work nonetheless. This one was 80% charged at the start of this video, and it's lasted through. If you're a shit shepherd with a fetish for rubber gaskets to dip your tools into dark dank holes, hey, this might be the right thing for you. No judgments, but for a non-pro schmo, it's probably not worth it. 
Get yourself a low-cost Guanzhou special USB endoscope from the flea bay to locate that gerbil that only occasionally goes wayward. Till next time, there'll be more room for duels. Thanks for watching.